So last week we were looking at Paul in the city of Ephesus, and we looked at when we spent a lot of time talking about Artemis Ephesia, the 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 Ephesian uh, the Ephesian Artemis, the Ephesian uh, goddess Artemis, who is a little bit different than the typical traditional historical Greek goddess Artemis. And he, she was kind of this uh, this hybrid between the Greek goddess and between another native goddess that had kind of been there already even before the Greeks arrived in the region of Ephesus. Um, from the city of Athens. We looked at, we, we saw how in the story, in the story where, we, in the story there in Acts 19, how we see, what we see is we see this almost kind of this cosmological battle taking place between God, between the God of Paul, between our God, the God of the Bible, and between Artemis. We saw how God basically came along and he flexed some muscle, showing the world that not only does he possess the dunamis, that spiritual power and authority, he is also the only God who truly has the kratos, who truly has the physical strength, the muscle to back up his claims. Ephesus was a blue-collar city full of merchants who had figured out how to get the most out of the local deity, the most out of Artemis. And one way that they did that is the local merchants began to create these, these little sort of mini Artemises, these little idols, so to speak. And they would sell these things on the main market areas. They would sell these things around the temple. And there were ways for people, there were ways for the merchants to make money. There were also ways for people to come and to buy their own little personal Artemis and, and take it with them on the road as they traveled or put it in their house where they could offer their own little mini sacrifices and have their own little mini ceremonies. And this was a major, major money maker for the economy in, in, in Ephesus. And when Paul came, comes along and he starts talking about this other God, this God who has more power than Artemis, who, is, who, has, who does more and who is responsible for more, that starts to get, that started to cut into their profits. And for those of you who might be in the business world, at least know a little bit about something about the business world, you like to make a profit. And when something comes along that begins to take profit away and lower the amount of money that you're making, the business world, they, it doesn't like that. Businesses don't like it when something cuts into their profits. And so... A silversmith by the name of Demetrius, who was living there in Ephesus, he got up this bright idea to start to try and in some ways kind of pick a fight with Paul. He didn't know too much about this God that Paul was talking about, but what he did know is that he was losing money because of what Paul was preaching. And so he thought, if I can get rid of Paul, if I can get him out of the city, then I can go back and I can start making money again. And so he started to rile up some of his fellow merchants, and before you know it, he, they were, this whole thing resulted in a, in a riot. It resulted in the amphitheater in Ephesus. 25,000 people crammed into this amphitheater, yelling for two straight hours, yelling as loud as they can, great is our... Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The way Luke describes the scene, the way he talks about the scene is that many of the people who were there didn't even know why they were there. Demetrius did such a good job of riling up the crowd and all these other people were standing around, you know, seeing, hey, there's all this commotion, there's a lot of stuff going on and everybody's talking about how great Artemis is and we like Artemis. And a lot of people there, they just decided to just join in just because. It sounded like a fun time and they had time, so why not? So you have this 25,000 people about in the theater and they're yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. That didn't, you know, really amount to a whole lot. It was shut down pretty quickly, kind of thankfully enough for Paul, but it was after that that Paul started to think, you know, it's probably about time that I start moving on. I've been in Ephesus now for about three years, the first three years of his third missionary journey. He's been in Ephesus for three years, and he probably started thinking, it's time for me to, to move on and go and see something else, to go and talk to some more people. I think the church here, I think we're okay. And so Paul takes off after this point. He takes off from Ephesus, and he goes out into the other areas of Macedonia, and, and he goes into the other areas of greater and larger areas of Greece, and continues on his missionary journeys, continues preaching, continues talking about the gospel and sharing Jesus and talking about God. And it's during that time after he leaves Ephesus that we run across the story of Eutychus. And Eutychus is another one of those kind of funny stories, if you have kind of a twisted sense of humor like I do, in which Paul, as, as preachers are sometimes prone to do, Paul was very long-winded. And you think, you know, you might have thought sometimes, you know, that I seem to just kind of talk and preach and go on and on and on, just how bad it can get. Paul, this is a great example, because in this story of Eutychus, Paul is preaching, he says, well after midnight, and yes, you heard me, not noon, midnight. Midnight. 
and he's preaching well after midnight and this young man named Eutychus is sitting up in the second story window and he falls asleep, which I know none of you would ever do if I preached after midnight. He falls asleep and he falls out of the window and he dies. And Paul is preaching and he sees this and he goes downstairs with, the group of, with some other people who are there he goes downstairs, and he, this miracle happens. Paul prays over this, this man, over Eutychus, and, and he's brought back to life. And what does Paul do? He goes back upstairs, and he keeps preaching. Yeah. Well, it's not that Paul doesn't value life. It's not that he didn't care, and there was no significance to what happened. It's that Paul was in a hurry, and he had a lot to say. He was leaving in the morning, and he just had to get it all out. But this was definitely a story that left a large enough impact on, on Luke, the author of Acts, and the other people around that it was worth putting in the story. So after that, he goes around, he travels around to a few more cities before deciding it's time for me to go back to Jerusalem. Paul needs to go back to Jerusalem because some of these churches that he had stopped at and some of these other places, they took an offering and he had money that he needed to bring back to Jerusalem. So he said, I need to go back to Jerusalem before finally making it all the way to Rome, which was really his ultimate goal in all of his missionary journeys. So on his way back to Jerusalem, he's on a boat, and he's on his way going back to Jerusalem. He decides not to stop in Ephesus, even though he's going right by there, probably for good reason, but he stops in a city by the name of Miletus. And it's there that we pick up in our text. Acts chapter 20 is where we're at and where we're going this morning. Acts chapter 20, where um, Paul is on his way. He makes his brief stop in the town of Miletus, which is just oh, maybe about 10, 15 miles or so, I think, away from the city of Ephesus. And that's where we're at this morning. Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 13. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on, and went on to uh, Mytilene, I think is how you pronounce that. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent, sent for, to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testings by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my, my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We're going to stop there, and then we'll finish off his address to the Ephesian elders next Sunday, actually. So Paul does something here in verses 18 and verse 24 that are actually, is actually kind of worth pointing out. And this is a little bit of a Bible study tip for you. If you're ever reading the Bible on your own, doing your devotions, you know, it's kind of something to keep in mind because it's relatively easy. And he does something that is technically called an inclusio. And verse 18 and verse 24 make this up, and I'll show you what I mean. What I mean is when you look at verse 18, Paul starts off and he says, You know how I lived. And then bouncing over to verse 24 again a second, verse 24 says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. What Paul does is he kind of puts this bracket, what this does kind of puts this bracket in there so that you have this idea of what comes in between those two verses really is all focused on and revolves around this concept of how we live, of life, and, how, and, and, and just kind of what's going on and, 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 so, and that sort of thing. It's worth noting that despite all the incredible things during Paul's time in Ephesus, when the Ephesian elders come and he kind of gives them in many ways sort of his last words to these Ephesian elders, he wants the elders, and by extension, extension, the church there in Ephesus, and even us today, he wants them to remember how he lived. That's the big push. That's the big thrust. That's the big thing, the big emphasis that Paul really wants to drive home and wants us, I think, to be thinking about today as we're looking at, this, at these verses here. How do you live? How do you live? We're coming down to the last couple weeks, 
um, with our viral series. We have two weeks left after this and in that we're going to be spending in the book of Acts. And so we're starting to come to this point in our series and our study where we're starting to kind of bring everything together. We're starting to bring bits and pieces of what we've talked about and starting to summarize and make a complete picture so that we're not left just kind of hanging there. And this is one of the things as we look at the book of Acts, when you start to, when you start to see and what I kind of hope you're starting to pick up is that the gospel was spread, the, the faith, the Christian faith, the gospel was spread in relatively normal ways ways throughout the book of Acts. You know, I know that may sound kind of weird because, I mean, we've seen, we've seen all sorts of things happen. We've seen miraculous healings. We've seen evil spirits cast out. We've seen people raised from the dead. We've seen speaking in tongues and prophesying. We've seen some really abnormal, unusual, in some ways kind of just outright crazy things happen. But, and it's not exactly, none of those things are exactly what we would, you know, necessarily label as being normal. But what I mean by normal is that the early church, as depicted in the book of Acts, the early church doesn't have a professional clergy. They don't have a professional clergy. They don't have an elder board or a deacon. Well, they do have elders and deacons, but they don't have this professional clergy that kind of goes to school and gets all professionalized and gets a degree like I did and then gets a job and this is all they do. What you see when we look at the book of Acts is that the church was not much more than really just kind of a ragtag group of people who, who were one thing one day and then the next day seemed to be something completely different. Kind of like, kind of like Paul himself on the road to Damascus. One day he's persecuting Christians, the next day he is a Christian. He becomes the most effective missionary the church has ever had. Kind of like the Ephesians before Paul shows up when they didn't even know that there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit and they have this conversion experience and they receive the Holy Spirit and now they're really disciples as we would think of as, of, as disciples. We don't see evangelism committees in the book of Acts. We don't see home missions boards. We don't see world missions departments. We don't see, um, we don't see directors of various ministries and, and positions and all this kind of stuff. What we see are ordinary, everyday people doing, going about their ordinary, everyday lives. Except the one difference is that these ordinary, everyday people they go about the ordinary everyday lives expecting the Holy Spirit to show up. And when he shows up, they are ready and willing and very quick to jump on board with what the Holy Spirit is doing. Verse 18, again. I said, hope I was in the right chapter. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. Not how I taught, not how I preached, not how I spoke, but how I lived. The Greek here actually literal, literally reads how I became. Paul uses, which is kind of, it's kind of an odd way of saying it. Paul uses not the word for live that we ordinarily see. He uses the word that we get with our English word genesis from. So it's more this kind of placing this, this emphasis on coming into existence or being born, which, which like I said, it's kind of an odd choice. It's kind of an odd way of saying this stuff. You know how I became. You know how I came into existence. You know what happened. You know what I did and who I was, not just how I lived, but who I was. Remember when we saw last week, we saw Paul arriving from Ephesus and he met some of these, he met these men who, who were described as disciples. And so there were, and, you know, and then there was kind of this conversion experience that took place. The Holy Spirit came, there was speaking in tongues, and there was prophesying. And I think Paul uses this word that he uses here on purpose when he's thinking about these things because in many ways, these disciples and these Ephesian Christians, they became something else. They became something. And Paul, as the missionary, as the church leader, as the, the pastor in some ways, he wanted to show them this is how you become when you come to faith. This is what it looks like. This is what you do. And then he spent the next three years in Ephesus modeling that. He gave them a picture of what exactly it looks like and how to do life with the Holy Spirit, how to do life with the gospel. You know how I lived. You know how I became. You know and you saw that I am just an ordinary everyday person, Paul says, who did ordinary everyday things, but I did them as an ordinary everyday person who has received the Holy Spirit and who has been transformed by the gospel. Yeah. I do them as an ordinary person who has been transformed by the gospel. Verse 19. 
I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Despite the fact that some were able to use my used Kleenexes or take my used Kleenexes or handkerchiefs is the technical word for Acts 19 and take them to go somewhere and they were somehow imbued with power to heal people. That's not what I want you to draw. That's not what I want to draw attention to. See, I didn't do those things, Paul says. It was the Holy Spirit that did those things. Me, I just simply lived. Me, I just simply went about my life the way that God has called me to do. I simply went about and did the things that I was able to do and that God had put in my path. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. I had the opportunity this week to hang out with the middle scores over at Contra Costa Christian. Um, it was good. It was fun. It was, um, middle score, you know, hanging out with middle scores is always an interesting experience, especially in a ministry setting. But this was um, really an enjoyable experience for me. And we talked, we talked, you know, I brought to them and I talked, we talked about Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, which is really all about not being ashamed of the gospel, not being ashamed of God, because God has the power and God's power is proven through the gospel and through what that means for us. And in many ways, we kind of see a little bit of a parallel going on here too, where Paul says, I have not hesitated to teach anything. Fear makes us hesitate. When we are afraid or anxious or ashamed of something, we tend to kind of hold back, to delay, to, to hesitate in what we are doing or what we are about to say. Hesitation almost some ways, in some ways suggests that we don't have the confidence that something is going to work out. We don't have the confidence or feel completely right and secure and at home or that we have the facts straight or sometimes maybe even to the most extreme cases, we're not even sure that we have the confidence that what we believe is even true or that it's going to hold up to the objections that somebody may throw out at us. This past week on Thursday, we took Kellen and Gideon out trick-or-treating. Um, that was, a, again, just a great experience, and it's, it's, it's just kind of fun to see the kids get dressed up and, and eat pizza and go nuts and eat candy, and then we're paying for it for the next six months because of the candy. But you know, one of the experiences, one of the doors we knocked on, we knocked on this door, and this man opened up, and he, he opened up the door, and he was wearing a skeleton costume. By the way, I did ask Kellen permission to share this, and he did say yes. Not that he wanted to say anything otherwise. But So this man opens the door. He's dressed up like a skeleton, and Kellen got scared. Not just scared like, you know, no, I don't want to go to that house. Let's go to the next one. Scared like running down the street crying. I can't get away fast enough kind of scared. Okay? And the entire night, I mean, that was toward the, the beginning of the night. The rest of the night, every house we went to, every driveway every door, he, he, he always asked, every single one, every single one, he was always asking, is this a scary house? Is this a scary, I don't want to go to that house, because, you know, that, that one house over there, that, that scared me, and I don't want to go to that house. Is this a scary house? And then when we were not go, actually going up to a house, he was constantly looking around over his shoulder. It's like, where's, where's the skeleton? Is the skeleton here? Is the skeleton home? And no matter what we did, we couldn't convince him otherwise. The skeleton actually came out. We ran into the skeleton, and he just, he just wanted to be nice. He wanted to say hi because he realized he scared Kellen, and we tried convincing him, saying, Kellen, it's okay. He's a nice skeleton. He's giving out candy. He just wants to say hello. It's, it's okay. I know none of this sounds weird or anything, but it's, you know, it's, no matter what we said, we couldn't convince him. Kellen was scared. And that fear carried over so that he was hesitant any time we got to a new house, any time we were going to knock on a door or ring a doorbell. He didn't know what was going to answer that door. And so he hesitated and he had fear. He was cautious. He didn't just jump right in like he did beforehand. That's what fear does. And Paul says, I didn't have fear. I didn't hesitate because I know what I believe. I know what I have. I know the gospel is true. I know there's purpose to it. I know it's right. I know it's something that everybody needs that's going to be beneficial for everyone. Doubt and hesitation and fear, these are normal parts of life. This is something that we all feel at some point, especially when it comes to thinking about what does it mean to be a viral Christian, to go out and to share the gospel or live the gospel. We get anxious, we get stressed, we become afraid, and we hesitate. Paul was convinced 
of the truth and the power of the gospel. He had personally experienced a transformation that the gospel can bring. He personally had a story to tell, and I suspect we all have a story that we can tell about how we have been changed by the gospel. And for that reason, Paul, he felt it was flat out wrong to hold back anything that would be helpful to the Ephesians. He put it all out there. Verse 22, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Wow. I mean, I read that and I'm just mind blown. I can't even comprehend having an attitude and a mindset like Paul in verse 24. I gotta, I, I gotta read that again because this verse, this is key. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's one of those things, we gotta break that down. We got we to gotta really wrestle with that because that, that verse, verse 24, that is a big deal. That verse is heavy. So I'm gonna, let's break that down for you know, just, just a minute here. The first part, just that first part a second. I consider my life worth nothing to me. So in other words, so in other words, when Paul looks at his life, when he looks at, um, you know, when he looks at, you know, what made him so successful, what made him so effective, why did he have the effect for the gospel that he did? I think actually, I think this is Paul's secret weapon right there. That first half of 24, that's Paul's secret weapon. If you ever wondering, you know, how, how did Paul do it? How can I do it? What is it going to take for me to be like Paul and to have that kind of effect? Verse 24, that's what it is. That is an incredibly, incredibly big reality check right there. Paul actually considered, he actually considered his life to be the least valuable thing he possessed. My guess, I mean, my guess, if you're normal, at least I think I'm normal, and if you're like me, my guess is that you'll have a hard time coming up with anything that you would consider to be more valuable than your life or the life of those you care about. Because life, that's sort of like the bottom line. We don't cross that line. We can lose everything. We could take, you know, potentially everything could be taken away from somebody, but you take somebody's life, you lose your life, you put your life on the line, that is a line that most of us, we are not going to draw. And for Paul, Paul, his life was worthless to him. It was invaluable. It had nothing. He had nothing in it. There was nothing there that he really valued. His life didn't matter. And I don't think it's because he was suicidal or he didn't value life, like I I mentioned earlier. I don't think it's because of any of that. I think it's because he understood what his purpose was. He understood why he had life. He understood what he had been called to do, what his mission was. He understood why God had created him. He understood what it was all about. And he understood when he looked at his life, that his life was in many ways, it was just a tool for the mission that God called him to. And it's that mission that he outlines in the back half of verse 24. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. See, this is it. Paul had the impact that he had on missions and on the church and on church history because he was willing to sacrifice everything to fulfill the mission that Jesus had called him to, specifically the mission to, or specifically to the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The good news of God's grace. Have you ever stopped to think about just how counterintuitive grace is? I mean, you think about it for a second. Grace really doesn't make any sense to us. Grace really doesn't, it doesn't get it. it, just, it we, we, we can't comprehend it because we live in this world and this culture in which grace, grace really doesn't exist. Grace is this idea of getting something that you don't deserve, not because you earned it or anything, but simply because somebody just simply wanted to give you something. It's free with no expectations of anything back. And the thing is, we live in a world where that doesn't happen. I mean, think about it for a second, how hard it is to accept a compliment or a gift without assuming that there's got to be a string attached to it. 
I mean, how uncomfortable does it make you when somebody just comes and says, you know what, you did a great job on that, or you are, I really appreciate you, or you know what, just because I was thinking about you, here's, here's, a, here's a gift, just because. The first thing that goes through my mind is, okay, what do you want? What, what do you want out of me? How do I need to repay this? And even if there are no strings attached to it, you still feel this obligation or sort of this, this need to go out and pay back in some way, to do something back. You know, and so maybe you might get a car, you might get a gift or pay the other person a compliment because you've got to give them something back. It's hard for us to just simply receive grace, to just take it as is, no strings attached. Grace doesn't work. It's counterintuitive to everything we think about. I'm no expert in world religions, but to my knowledge, Christianity is the only religion that exists today or ever has existed in which grace really is grace. We receive something from God just because God wants to give it to us. We can't work hard enough to earn it. We can't do anything. We can't say enough prayers. We can't, there's no way, nothing that we can do to receive that or earn it. God just gives it to us. What's more is that Paul doesn't say he preached the good news of God's grace. It says he testified to the good news of God's grace. And he uses the word for testimony. He uses the word martureo, which I've talked about before. We've talked about before in the book of Acts way back a long time ago when we first started. It's where we get our English word martyr from. You don't become a martyr because of the words you speak. You become a martyr because of how you live. You become a martyr because of the things you do. We're starting to see this in many ways. We're starting to see this kind of come full circle again. Paul is emphasizing how he lived. Paul didn't just preach God's grace. Paul lived God's grace. You know, don't get trapped into thinking either that this is kind of unique to Paul. It wasn't just Paul who was called to live God's grace. It wasn't just a unique calling that was placed upon him and we are now somehow excluded from this. You know, we'll see this again next week, more fully next week when Paul, you know, emphasizes or encourages the Ephesian elders to mimic him or to do what he is doing. But, but there's this idea that, you know, the Ephesians couldn't simply preach God's grace because there's an awful lot of preaching going on already then. There's an awful lot of preaching from a lot of different areas and voices going on with us today. It's not just simply enough to preach God's grace. It was the testimony it was the witness. It was how they lived. It's how you live that makes all the difference, that backs up the words that come out of your mouth or comes out of, or came out of their mouth. Remember, Paul says, remember how I lived the whole time I was with you. Paul lived God's grace. That, of course, begs the question for us, for what exactly does it mean to live God's grace? How do we do that? You know, we live in an area, you know, kind of this area of the Bay Area. We live in this area that in many ways sort of prides itself and is defined in terms of by the rest of the country, is defined as a place where there's an awful lot of grace. There's not a whole lot that we put restrictions on. There's not a whole lot of behavior, not a whole lot of lifestyle choices, not a whole lot of actions and deeds and things like that that we put restrictions on. We kind of have this idea that the only thing that we're going to really discourage is an attitude that is perceived as being discouraging to somebody else. We don't, we, we, we pride ourselves almost in this area. The culture around us prides themselves on being gracious and having a form of grace and practicing that. So what really makes God's grace any different? What makes it any different for how we, how you or how I, how we live God's grace compared to everybody else? God's grace is the thing that makes him accessible to us. God's grace is the thing that makes him accessible. It's his grace that was personified in Jesus first and climaxed at the cross. And so to say that Paul lived God's grace and that we are to live God's grace is in some ways almost like saying we are to personify grace in a similar way that Jesus personified grace. When it comes to being a disciple or being created in God's image, that's very much at the heart of this as well. 
What that means is that when we go out and when we interact with the world, and I mean, and I really do mean go out, when we go out and interact with the world, because God went out to us, when we go out and interact with the world, we go out as martyrs testifying to the good news of God's grace. Until the people around you see and experience the way God's grace has affected you, has changed you, has transformed you in everything that you do, until they see a gospel that actually has a tangible effect in the way you live and do things things, simply preaching won't do a bit of good. It's not about simply preaching grace. It's not about living by God's grace. It's living God's grace, period. When it comes to God's grace and the gospel, the world that we live in, really the world that we live in is a world full of Missourians. You know, the show me state. Everybody wants to be shown. We talk about actions speak louder than words it's because until we actually live it and people see how it affects us, the words don't mean a thing. How do you live? How do you live? How can you live God's grace in the places he has put you in? How will you exemplify and practice and live the transformation that only God's grace can bring. How do you do that? Where do you do that? When do you do that? The when is always. The how and the where is part of your own unique place and call. How do you live God's grace? How will you live God's grace in the coming week? That's your homework for the week, by the way. That's your homework. There's going to be a test next week on that. How do you live? Let's pray.